Good morning. This is Marissa from Book Studio 16. We're with one of our favorite teams, Library Love Fest. And our theme today is Delectable Reads. And they've prepared some delicious Italian food for us. It's not even Sunday. It's not even the Sunday meal. We're doing it on Friday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what's going on. Gravy, gravy for a Friday morning. So, hi everyone, how are you? We are fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, better now. And, <laughs> hey um, Yes, so we are uh, talking about a bunch of books today. Um, before we even mention these, I ju we're just back from the ALA Midwinter Conference where we had a terrific time, and the author of the first book that we're gonna talk about, Juliet Grames, who wrote The Seven or Eight Deaths of Stella Fortuna, was in Seattle and wowing the crowds wherever she went because this book is amazing. You know who else is amazing? These two. Lainey, well you're Lainey, <laughs> and you're Chris. <laughs> and no one works harder than these two guys and we ran around like nuts and I am the luckiest person in the world to have the strongest team in publishing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. shout out, shout I'm out kids. We're a family Goodbye. dinner. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye bye, that's love what we that have. Time we have a, that's the love fest. <laughs> it's totally true. Virginia, totally people true. are already tuning in and watching live with us. Yes. We have Carla, she says good morning from Alabama. Kimberly says good morning. Happy Friday, friends. Happy Friday mm -hmm. back at ya. Okay, so, <laughs> all right. So, we're talking today first about this fabulous book that we are all kind of in love with, right? Yes. Love, Heart. love, love. The Seven or Eight Deaths of Stella Fortuna by Juliet Grames. Uh, we're, we have the marketing director from Echo who is going to talk about the book because we have talked about this book since Juliet was born. <laughs> um, and um, we thought it would be fun to have uh, Megan come in and talk a little bit about it. One of the things that we have here thanks to the fabulous Echo uh, marketing team, is this <clears throat> recipe uh, booklet, which uh, is inspired by the characters in this novel. So this is a beautiful uh, tale of uh, these two young girls and uh, the start of their life in Calabria, Italy, and it's multi-generational and spans decades and it ends up in the United States and it's a tale of Im immigration and no matter how many times we talk about it, there's always something else that you can say about this book, right? Yeah, it's so multi-layered. It's kind of like Calabria itself. I found the intro fascinating where, you know, it, Juliet's describing, you know, Calabria, and it's very isolated, but it's also been kind of taken over by so many different, um, you know, cultures and societies, and they all have their own religions and, and, and histories. And it comes through both in the story, but also the recipes and, and just how she describes it. It's um, true. It's really fascinating. Um, but it's also, as you've said, I always like to pull, steal your quote, because you give the best quotes, V, is the characters just stick with you. Like you're mm -hmm. thinking about them when you're not reading the book. You'll read this, put it down, and be wondering what's happening, what's happening to Stella, what's happening to her sister. It's just such, it's a book that lives. It's just, it, mm. it's full of life. I mm. absolutely loved it. So Yeah. Um, so, and speaking of quotes, do you ah, want to hit him yeah. with? Yeah, we have a heck of a quote. Um, so, uh, Juliet knows everyone, and everyone is loving this book, author, friends, industry people, but one quote we just got in that we're thrilled about is from the one and only Nancy Pearl, famous librarian, author of George and Lizzie, and she's also the author of the Book Lust series of reading recommendations. And this is what she has to say. Right from the first page, I was transported to Calabria, Italy, and into the lives of Stella Fortuna and her sister Tina. Spanning decades from the native beauty of their mountain village to the suburbs of Connecticut, this is a heart-filled, cinematic story of immigration, love, family, and resilience. An unforgettable, excuse me, an unforgettable novel filled with characters I don't think I'll ever forget. That's from Nancy Pearl. I think that kind of says wow. it right there. Pretty do pretty much does. So um, we are going to have Megan Deans come in and talk to us. And while she's talking to us, we're going to um, serve some of the food that the three of us made from this booklet, which is frightening. <laughs> but I'm sure it's going to be great. So um, do you want to come on in? And, um, oh. Nope. Oh. You're taking off? Well, come back in. It's fine. <laughs> Hi, Lainey. Okay. Bye. So nice to see you. Welcome <laughs> to family dinner. Thank you. Man, rough family dinner. You kick people out really quick. Get out. 
So Megan Deans, can you see Megan Deans? Are we good? Hi everybody. Megan Deans, marketing director. At I'm Echo. honored to be here. We're happy that you're in our hut. It's very exciting for me. So, okay, so we've made uh, we've made a little something, and do you want to talk about the book a little bit? I more? would love to. I okay. mean, Chris and Nancy have already done an amazing um. job. Um, I will say, you know, I am the Echo marketing director, so it is my job to love my books. But um, <laughs> even if I didn't work here, uh, I can genuinely say I would be a huge fan of this book, a huge fan of Juliet. Um, the first time I read this book, the first, I read it multiple times because I love it. Um, I, I just, I couldn't stop. I had a manuscript. I was like reading it on the train on the way home. I was at home like like flipping through my e-reader. I couldn't stop. Um, these characters are so vibrant and real and it really is uh, an incredible immigrant story, I mm. think. And it's it's really a, a story about um, these these two sisters and, and their families. You get to know generations of people through this book. Um, I think if you've ever, you know, looked at an old photograph of one of your own ancestors or or somebody, you know, somebody else you know and wondered, like, what did they go through to get here? Like, how did I even get here? Um, this is a book that sort of, like, taps that nerve and, and really makes you feel the resonance of, of everyone who's come before. I, you know, <clears throat> I have to say, I was, I, my grandmother came here from Galway when she was 13 years old by herself. I mean, somebody was meeting her, but I can't even imagine what that was like. Um, and this book reminded me of that. Like, what did she go through? Mm -hmm. This she was a kid, um, and so there's. Uh, it's 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 just a it's like a beautiful story. And and what I said, what Chris said, what you, what Nancy said. You can't stop thinking, what is going on with these? What's going on with them? You know, when you're in a in a meeting and you mm -hmm. you can't be reading the book. You can't stop thinking about them. What a beautiful writer she is. She's the associate Incredible. publisher of Soho Press and a wonderful writer and a wonderful speaker and just a lovely person. But all of those are extra because it starts with the book and that's where we, and that's the, the launching off point. So um, also in this galley, there's this really neat, I love this, this oh, family. Yeah, the family tree. And this will, this is in the galley. This will be in the finished books as well. It's also in this recipe booklet. Um, uh, Love that. There's a couple things in here that are beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, the family tree here. Um, this recipe booklet, which I believe is available digitally yes, on is. the Library yes. Love Fest uh, yeah. website, also has this really lovely hand-drawn map of, of Evely, which is the town where the story begins. So there's a lot of really cool stuff in here, um, as well as some recipes. Which, uh, which were written by Juliet herself. Unbelievable. And speaking of, we're about to dole out some of Asunta's Sunday sauce. You want to talk about Asunta? I, w I would oh. love to. I'm, well, I'm, I mean, la, 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 well, while you guys while you guys are serving this yeah. up, somebody wants to know, which I think is an interesting question: Is this fiction or nonfiction? Uh -huh. This is fiction. Um, it, there is a really lovely letter that Juliet's written that's in this cookbook where she sort of talks about how it was inspired by some events in her own family. Um, but um, she said she's very cleverly. She, she'll never tell you which parts are real and which parts are fiction. And, uh, which parts she made up. She uh, she's very good like that. Like all the greatest fiction writers, I think she's taken a real story and she synthesized it with um, her imagination and and just created something that's wholly new. So friends out there, join the family dinner, ask some questions. Yes. And comment on some of the food that you're seeing or some of the recipes in the book that you love. If you go to librarylovefest.com, we have pinned to the top of the, of the page um, a lot of information about this book, including um, a video of, of Juliet Graham. She came into the office. She spoke to a lot of librarians who we invited here for lunch. Um, this recipe card is there, so you can download that and you can make this delicious stuff yourself. Um, pasta and sauce and Chris made the eggplant and Lainey made the cookies and so much fun. It's just a beautiful book. So I encourage you to go to Library Love Fest. You will see so many different assets that just will bring you in, including a wonderful, very quick video made by Kim Raycon who works for Academic Marketing. Every time I see it, I cry. It's crazy. That video makes me it's cry. It's really lovely. It's really mm -hmm. lovely. Okay. Kim's a filmmaker. The Kim's a filmmaker. <laughs> so I'm pouring on some beautiful sauce from the recipe card. Mm -hmm. And Chris, do you want to talk about your eggplant? Yeah. So, um, and just to frame this a little bit, Asunta is um, is Stella's mother in the story. Yep. Uh, while she's growing up in Italy, uh, Asunta is essentially a single mother. The Her husband, uh, Stella's father, is... <laughs> He's mostly absent, and when he isn't absent, 
you know, you kind of wish he would be absent. He's mm -hmm. kind of just like this semi-destructive force in their lives. Um, so Asunta is a fascinating character that you meet immediately in the story. And she's, you know, a big part of it is cooking um, and surviving, really, in, in Calabria when things are really, really hard. Mm. Um, but just to frame the story a little bit, Stella, who is this amazing kind of kind of golden child, she shines very brightly, but she also has a habit of nearly dying and seemingly, you know, doing boring, normal things, including uh, when her mother is cooking eggplant and she reaches for an eggplant and something happens. I don't want to ruin any of the potential deaths. Um, so this recipe here is Asunta's uh, eggplant cutlets, <coughs> uh, which are super simple. Well, some, somewhat simple. I don't want to sell my own effort short. Um, <laughs> super simple, but expertly made. Yeah, it's 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 all in the execution. Um, Thank so you. you're welcome. So Chris, you spent the time <coughs> and you made these yourself last night. I made them this morning. I did a test run last night just to make sure I could do them properly. Um, and the real secret here is pressing them down. You salt them for like 30 minutes, let them sit. Then you wash them, you dry them, and try to get out as much of the moisture as you can. Press them down. And then it's just a beautiful combination of flour, egg, and breadcrumbs. And you dip it in those three, pan fry them, and then enjoy the... Uh, the eggplant goodness. They're super delicious. You so, never and, stop impressing us. You know, I, I don't like to remain static. Cooking is my new thing, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do it right. And these cutlets really pair well with like any sort of tomato-based sauce, which Virginia so expertly put together. Yes, I did. So, I followed the directions here, and she said, "You, you know, you pop your whole tomato, pop yeah. your tomatoes, which I did, <laughs> and um, lots of garlic, and uh, oh, and some paste, and some cheese rind." I said, "Who's got cheese rind just laying around?" And my wife said, "We do." <laughs> so I said, "Oh, okay." So she was an enormous help. Um, and anyway, yes, so, and we made the pasta this morning at home, and we're all just like a group effort celebrating this book uh, because it is a delicious read, and there are some delicious recipes here. Uh, go to Library Love Fest and check all of that out and um, enjoy on every level. You and will. Rosemary says she makes eggplant almost every week, and she loves it. Huh. I'm a convert. It's right, not Rosemary. just an emoji. It's actually a delicious <laughs> food as well. Okay, so um, would, you like to, would you like to take some? Would you like? What would you like to do? I, well, I, I I feel a little bad because I know Lainey baked these cookies. Is that true? Lainey baked the cookies. Okay. I just want to give her a shout out because well, she, Lainey, I cooked her. I, I kicked her out of her seat. <laughs> All right, Lainey, come back in and talk about your cookies. Yes, because Stephanie says someone may have asked this, but I thought I heard you say cookies. What kind of cookies? <laughs> mm. So she's gonna tell well, you now. Take it to go. Take it to go. <laughs> take it to go. <laughs> so funny. Thank you, Megan. Yeah. Um, Megan, thank you so much. Stay and eat. Oh, do you want some limoncello? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, lemoncello. Okay, we'll tell about the cookies and then we'll have a toast. Okay. So the cookies are Tina's cookies, which is Stella's sister. And it's, they, I, I have to say I'm very proud that they match the cover of the book mm. with the um, icing. But it's just a lot of flour and a lot of cocoa. And it's, it's super simple. You just combine them all and then bake them. And then you put this really yummy glaze on them and she said you have to put sprinkles because they would decorate them as kids so put the sprinkles on and quite yummy mine comes at the end of the meal but it'd be exciting to get to i say dessert oh, you should always start with dessert sure. any okay. of those all right i'm no fool Let's start with dessert mm -hmm. scooter can you see them oh, yeah. got it okay right. good Okay, somebody wants to. Somebody's questioning your decision of lemoncello before 11 a.m. <laughs> so what? Listen, it's got to be five o'clock somewhere. Fruit. Have they met it's us before? <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. All right. Oh, these are really good, Lainey. Wait, oh, let me. Have. Thank you. Dessert first. Oh. Life's too short. Oh my god. Ooh. It has raisins and yeah. coffee. Oh my god. Raisins and coffee. Mm -hmm. Wow. They're fabulous. The you gotta try one. Yeah, try one. Oh my god. Okay, I'm sorry, but I think let's we're making her hold. And then I'll come. Okay, hold have everything. some cello. Mm. I'm just gonna hop her in the back. Okay. Amanda <laughs> likes your decision cheers. to put sprinkles. She oh, says okay. they look yummy. Okay. Megan is about to So here we go. Stop everything. Cheers to the cheers. seven or eight deaths of Stella mm -hmm. Fortuna by Juliet Grames. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm. Mm. That'll get me started. Pretty strong. I like Ready it. Ready to work. Ah, I love the smell of lemoncello in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I'm gonna take this to go. <laughs> okay, take a cookie. Thank you. Oh, I got one. Oh, okay, it great. It looks like a meatball, but it's a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Well, thank you, thank Megan. You. Thank you, Megan. Okay. <sighs> well, wow. my goodness. Stella Palooza. I'm a Stella Palooza. I didn't get any eggplant. I was oh, for oh, goodness no. sake. Where's the thing? I gotta get eggplant. Oh, I like eggplant. Thank Boom. you. Boom. Oh, nice. So we're going to sit in silence for the next 15 <laughs> minutes and eat. And then. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yes. So now we have to. We are going to talk about some more books that we think are just delicious. Mm -hmm. um, oh, God, I love that. This so. is the delectable reads part, right? This is the delectable reads. Mm -hmm. I wish you going back with that plate. Oh, my wife's going to. Meh. Okay. Um, uh, is fabulous. Okay. Let me. Let, okay. Oh, I forgot to bring knives. Megan anyway. took my fork, so I'm gonna have to try with a spoon. Oh. And also the. But that's okay. The proper Ooh. way to. Mm. Oh, here you do it like this. You put true. Look, look, look at that. Well. That's the way. Okay. That's very. That's controversial. Why? Really? I don't know. Some people, audience weigh in spoon or no spoon with the spaghetti. Oh, listen, just did I not hand. mention that my grandmother's from Galway? <laughs> Why no? <laughs> they have a strong pasta tradition. Oh, Galway, my goodness. They not? Mm. Very mm. good, guys. Good job. Nice going. Seriously, mm -hmm. it was yeah. delicious. This is delicious. Wow. All right, I'll see you guys later. Yeah, bye. Yeah, right. All right. Books? Books. Mm. Books. Oh, books, yeah. books, books, and more books. books. Um, can I talk about a book? I oh, usually... Yes. Uh, go not first but i'm gonna go first because we're talking about families um i love this book kate mulgrew uh this is um this is a story of this so this is the actress kate mulgrew she has a long and storied and wonderful career uh as an actor she was in ryan's hope uh she's a stage actress uh she was in star trek she's in orange is the new black she has done so much um this book is about her parents, um, sadly um, ailing and needing help. So she goes back to her home, her childhood home, to be with them, to help them, to, um, to I don't know, just to sort of, you know, to, to be of any assistance that she can be. This book is so beautiful. It's it's separated into two parts. The first part is de is dedicated to her. These are her parents on the front, and then the first part is dedicated to um, her father. The second half of the book is dedicated to her mother, um, and it talks about their lives prior to having met each other, um, and what you know what what formed their what, what informed their lives and what whom what made them who they are, and then them together and then them raising a family and her relationship with them and her siblings relationship with them um, I feel like this is a book that anybody can come to you don't need to be a follower of Kate Mulgrew's theatrical uh, work it's not it's not that yes she's a, she's a wonderful renowned actress but there's uh, this the story is uh, it's just universal Frankly, we went to ALA and we and I talked this book to so many people, and they said, "You know, I have an ailing parent. I have an I have an elderly parent, and um, could relate to so much of this." So um, it it's uh, it's in addition to and it's sad. There are moments of of sadness. There are also moments where I was on the plane, laughing out loud. So I was puddling up at, at moments and then laughing at others. The man sitting next to me was like security but um but uh it's just it's beautiful it's beautifully written she's a poet this woman can craft words she's a wonderful actress she's as, she's just as wonderful a writer they are there are beautiful passages in this book the way she has put this together i tell you i i this blew my hair back in many ways emotionally i just was stunned by how beautiful and how touching and how honest unflinchingly honest this book is how she is about her family but again I can't stress enough that you do not need to be a follower of her theatrical work in order to appreciate what is in this the pages of this book I'm I love this book so that's how to forget by Kate Mulgrew 
Awesome. Virginia, people are adding this to their TBR list Good. as we speak. I would so. love to hear what you all have to think. I really would because I, I just absolutely adore it. Okay. Uh, well, I have one that's um, a little less serious, but it has to do with our food theme. And I'm really excited about this one. I think it's so cute. And it's called Bon Appetit. Oh! <laughs> and it's so cute. B-O-N-E. <laughs> so it's for your dog. It's a cookbook for your dog. And <laughs> so, um, so Deborah Robertson is um, a journalist. She writes and she cooks and she's made this cute little... 50 clean recipes for your doggy, and so when you're cooking all this fabulous food, you can make something for your dog. But it's super simple and easy. It's not like a lifestyle change for your dog where you're not giving them food. It's little treats you can make, and everything comes from your pantry, and it has these adorable little drawings. So this one says Christmas dinner, and it has a little doggy, and it tells you what you can make for your dog on Christmas dinner. Read it, read it. Oh, gosh, okay. Um, <laughs> Turkey, Brussels sprouts, <laughs> carrots, yeah. mashed potato, gravy. I know how to make them and easy for your dog. There's a feel better. Oh my food god, the section. pictures. Yeah. Adorable. They're so sweet. Okay, I best. have a question. Yes. Yeah. Can people eat these recipes as well? Well yeah, it's everything from your pantry. So every you know, you're not adding anything that's it's for clean recipes, so you're not adding anything to it. But yeah, just you just have to eat it out of a dog bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Let me right, somebody wants to know: Is there a book in the works for cats as well? I don't know. Maybe there's 50 recipes in this one, so you can just you know maybe your cat can enjoy it too. But we won't say anything. I'm not saying a word. Um, I don't know if cats. a cat that might be too too much for a cat. They might be like, I need more. I need more than this. But if you have a good fancy cat. Fancy. <laughs> cookbook pun title that we can use because that's really what we need here we have bone appetite i don't yeah, know what yeah, it would be for you're a right. cat yeah, like, yeah, yeah cat. throw that out yeah. there yes i don't have one I'm, I'm actually coming short on the puns today <laughs> so so did you guys hear that crowdsource that all right There's, so yeah. say that again what are yeah. you asking all right so we need a great idea for a punny cat cookbook title so if you have one in mind that's on par with bone appetite Please throw it out there. You never know. It might end up on a cat cookbook somewhere. All right. Chris has thrown down the gauntlet. Uh, hey you do it. So. And this even has um, nutritional information, too. So if you're kind of worried about giving your dog other things, you can kind of. And at the beginning, it kind of walks you through, like, how to decide, like, are you going to do meat? Are you not going to do meat? It's got everything. It's very sweet and hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. Like a vegetarian dog. <laughs> how about perfectly delicious? Oh, Rosemary just Perfect. came up with perfect. perfect. Bango! Perfect. Rosemary, we're on the same page. Somebody has uh, perfect food for your cats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I like this one. Meowlicious. Oh! oh I like this. Meowlicious. I'm trying to think of something with furball, but that's not very appetizing. That's the diet book. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> oh. All right, so what's next, friends? I don't know. Uh, what are we talking I'll about? I'll talk about a novel. I'm going to talk about The Song of the Jade Lily by Kirsty Manning. Here is the jacket, which is beautiful. Um, and there's so much to unpack with this novel. Um, this is very much in the vein of the Alice Network, the women in the castle, we were the lucky ones. Just, you know, great pieces of World War II fiction. And so Kirsty is a best-selling author in Australia, so we're really excited to bring uh, her here and publish her. This is her U.S. debut. And it's, it, it jumps in time, but it starts in 1939. And if you didn't know, Shanghai, China, was um, a big uh, place for Jewish refugees during World War II. And so you follow two young girls who meet in Shanghai during this time. You have Li, who's local, and then Romy, who is a Jewish refugee. And they meet as young women, and they become fast friends. But certain circumstances in life pull them apart. And you don't find out exactly what, but you jump forward to 2016, and Romy's granddaughter now um, has returned home to Australia from London. And, you know, as you know, people are want to do, she wants to find out more about her grandparents and her family history. And she starts to uncover some kind of big time family secrets in doing so uh, that kind of makes her 
it encourages her to find out what happened to Lee and what kind of these secrets that Romy's been holding on to her entire life. Um, so it's this really fascinating kind of, you know, she's trying to get to the bottom of these secrets and, and these fragments from her family history um, and really um, bringing to the front certain things that you might not want to admit. It's it's really beautiful, though, and, and again, the real historical facts that inspired it, I find, are so fascinating. But really, the story of these two women, that's what's driving this story, and they're so well-painted and just multi-layered. Um, this is a great book club book. Um, it's coming May 14th, so we have a little bit of a wait, but if you need reading materials, I believe we have galleys, so I'll send you one. Um, Again, for fans of the Alice Network, I really think that's a great comp. Um, and actually, I have a great quote from Heather Morris, who is the number one New York Times bestselling author of The Tattooist of Auschwitz, which is another good comp. And she says, uh, Kirstie Manning weaves together little-known threads of World War II history, family secrets, the past, and the present into a page-turning, beautiful novel. I think that says it right there. So please do check it out. It's the Song <laughs> of the Jade Lily. So to interject, Stephanie, no, Terry, I think, wins the contest for the cat book okay. with the title Cooking from Scratch. Oh! oh. Nice. She does win. We are off Thank our Thank you, budget. Terry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're making yeah. up for it. Yeah. Cooking from Scratch. Yep. And then, like, so maybe the, the cover should be, like, a cat at a scratching post with, like, maybe a plate But it's plate a cheese of... grater. Oh! oh. oh. <laughs> yes, she's got it. Yes! Yes! It right. never ends. It's not funny to me, but I want something with, like, you... scratchy tongue. I, and I'm, I'm just thinking of the <laughs> aspects of cats. Like, tongue. They have dry, scratchy tongues. They do. Let's not even talk to... about it. I'm, I'm feeding out ideas, and then oh. hopefully people circle back feeding with Feeding out. Parts. Feeding okay. out. Uh, okay. uh, there you go. Okay. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get back We home. will. We will. So uh, Tammy wants to know, the book that you just discussed, is it on Edelweiss? It is. Uh, yes, it is. And mm, it's yeah. also on... Net Galley. Net Galley, Net Galley. Um, for those of you watching at home, uh, we are now, we have a selection of selection. titles on Net Galley available for download. So if you want to be added to the auto approved list where you know you can just download anything that we have available, email us, librarylovefest at harpercollins.com. That's open to public librarians in the United States. Um, and it's a beautiful system, it's easy to use. And uh, we're super thrilled just to have more ways for you all to read our books. So. And vote for Library Reads. Yes. So, so, so yeah, um, we're very excited about this. And um, we still, you know, <clears throat> all of our books are on Edelweiss. And a large selection of books are on uh, NetGalley. And this has been a, a big undertaking for us. And again, Lainey and Chris knocking it out of the park here. Yeah. We just sent out a big e-blast to um, subscribers um, uh, NetGalley. And uh, getting great responses, so we're really encouraged and very happy to have those books um, available to you. So, mm -hmm. yes, many ways to get Song of the Jade Lily. As well as the Seven or Eight Deaths of Stella Fortuna, that's also available. Yes, it is. Uh, the perfect, for well, okay, so pretty much I think we'll let you know what it's what like format it's available yeah. in for yeah. all of these, but um, yeah, we're super excited, so... Um, I want to go back to the food thing for one sec, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, I um, have one too. So. Oh, okay, good. So this is Secrets of Great Second Meals uh, by Sarah Dickerman. This is uh, flexible modern recipes that value time and limit waste. So I'm sure we're all guilty of it. I know I am, and I hate waste. Um, but when you, uh, you know, <clears throat> make your meal and then you throw the rest in the refrigerator and nine times out of ten, we're throwing that out um, once it starts to grow stuff. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> sort of. Come self-aware. Self-aware, yes. This is James Beard Award <laughs> winner, Sarah Dickerman. Um, and, um, and this is her wonderful cookbook, beautiful cookbook, uh, offering uh, suggestions and beautiful recipes for meals that you can make using your leftovers. And what's cool about this book is that each recipe starts with the extra ingredient. So if you have cooked oatmeal leftover, here you go. You can make spiced oatmeal buttermilk pancakes. Mm -hmm. mm -mm -mm -mm. That slap your mama good. And look how delicious that looks. No waste and um, and and this and the second meals are she's treating them like their first meals. This is not to be thought of as leftovers. This is be thought of as 
when you're making your meals to begin with, think ahead. What can you rep how can you repurpose what's left over? Because undoubtedly there will be ingredients left over from whatever you've made. So it's great for reducing waste and um, you know having a, a wonderful. This was in response to an article that she wrote for Slate called "In Praise of Leftovers." Um, and it's uh, it's just that it's re it's using what's left over to create big, beautiful, gorgeous menus and uh, meals that appear to be made for the first time. So it's glorious. It's out now. You can buy it, and it's just it's just absolutely beautiful. Every single page, every single recipe, they're accessible and they're delicious. And I cannot recommend it highly enough. Is there anything else I need to tell you? Oh, let me just tell you this. At her house. Reinvention means pureeing roasted vegetables into a quick soup, right? So, you know, how many times do you have some stuff left over? Then now it's a soup. Um, uh, making a beautiful salad with uh, second day salmon or stuffing cooked rice into roasted, roasted poblano peppers, which is uh, such a good thing. So anyway, there's endless recipes that you can find in here. And um, I just think it's really cool. I think it's very important. So um, Secrets of Great Second Meals by Sarah Dickerman. So I have another cookbook that's coming up in April that I am excited about and I will get to it. So I only have the cover printed right here. And actually, if I was reading the book, this is what it would look like to you. Nice. Um, but this is called Heirloom Kitchen by uh, Anna Francis Das. And um, Anna went to the French Culinary Institute. Um, she went there after working in sales. She was like, I'm not, I'm not happy, I'm going. I'm gonna cook and she's a big chef and um, but she decided so her parents came here from Italy and she was growing up and her mom would make all of these great meals but then when she went to go try to figure out her recipes she was like mom we gotta write this like you're just throwing things in there I don't know how to make this so she sat down with her mom and came up with these really detailed recipes so she could make it and her mom was telling her all these stories about how food really meant something to her when she came over here because everyone has to eat, everyone has to feel at home and how America is such a big melting pot for all of the food and we just have taken all these cultures, we've taken in all of their food and we enjoy it. And it's really a point of, it is difference, but a point of uh, learning about someone and how they would prepare their food and all of, anyway. So she found all of these women, all of these immigrant women who came to America and they really connected with the food they made. That's how they felt at home and that's how they made their kids feel welcome and uh, it's, it makes me, it's so special to me. So Anna, Anna came up with this cookbook, Heirloom Kitchen, and I have a few spreads. There's recipes in there and then there's, I can pull yeah. one too. I have a lot of pages along. because the editor's amazing. And so you see pictures of these women that she went to go meet and learn. Pictures of them and their kids and coming to America, all of their, their passport photos in here. All of these wonderful things are in this book. And I, you have to go to Edelweiss and check out some of these spreads. But we, we had Anna and her editor on our podcast. And mm. I found it so amazing to listen to her. She she knows these women. She got to know them. Christina, her editor's mom, is in the book really? because she's an immigrant, and she got to know her. And she's like, it's so exciting because these kids have these recipes that their moms cook, and she doesn't know how to make them. They can feel something and connect to their family and their heritage. So there's people from all over, and funnily enough, Calabria. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> Greece, Scotland, the Ukraine, Moscow, Serbia, Poland. I could go on and on. There's 175 photographs. All of these food and recipes are in there and well documented. Anna just really connected to these women. But on the podcast, when she was talking to her editor, she's, one of the women, Tina, told her this this about the coming to the U.S. And I just have to read it because it's. I still think about this. She said, people refer to the U.S. as a melting pot, but I'm not so sure. Instead, I think America is more of a stained glass window. We come here, live, but we still remain who we are, and blend, and they blend together. And I just think it's so beautiful. You have to go listen to her describe meeting these women. She's like, I feel like I have like ten grandmas now. They call me and tell me about new things that are going on in their lives. And I just think it's a great way to connect to who we are and to how uh, and the immigrant experiences in general. 
It's really great. Mm -hmm. That's Heirloom Kitchen. It's a really special book. Beautiful. Cookbook. Yeah, it's Anna Francis' gas. Yeah, it's just, it is. It's a history book. It's coming out in April. So people are responding to both of these cookbooks, The Leftover Cookbook and Heirloom okay. Kitchen. Good. So somebody said the uh, leftover one, they're gonna, it's going to be their new gift book idea. Yeah, it's a great yeah. gift book, yeah. Um, I'll talk, maybe I'll round this out with the cookbook as well. Um, I will talk about Vegetables Unleashed by Jose Andres and Matt Golding. Uh, so these two worked on a book that released last year, We Fed an Island, which detailed Jose's traveling to Puerto Rico during Jose, uh, or excuse me, during Hurricane Maria, where, you know, it, basically Puerto Rico had no access to clean water, food, you know, they were ravaged and they had no help coming uh, from the states. So Jose took it upon himself, and again, this is documented in that book, to him and his team go and feed hundreds of thousands of people hundreds of thousands of meals uh, to get them through that. Um, Jose is a you know famous James Beard award-winning chef. Um, he's, he's, he's everywhere and he's a really fascinating guy and he's incredibly talented. So this is our first cookbook with him and we're absolutely thrilled about it. This is a plant-centric cookbook, Vegetables Unleashed. It's coming May 21st. Uh, so for any of you carnivores out there, do not worry. This is a split between, you know, some straight vegetarian meals and then vegetarian or vegetable centric meals with meat involved. Um, but I think eating clean and vegetable focused diets are such a huge thing now. Um, and he makes it very accessible. Um, you know, th this is a beautiful book. Um, but again, it's just, I, as, as someone who again has taken up cooking recently and just knowing how to approach certain things, vegetables are such a powerful tool to make your meals both diverse and varied, but also healthy and delicious. Um, and the mix of flavors and, and recipes in this are just amazing. So um, this is again coming May 21st, it's Vegetables Unleashed. Um, and I can't wait to pull some recipes from it. Maybe okay, and wait for you to cook for us. Well, mm -hmm. um, maybe there will be an eggplant recipe in there now that I'm a <laughs> pro eggplant maker. This is really good. Like, I'm really fighting mm -hmm. getting, like, you know, I know. Some ugly eating where I'm just I mean, face so first. Has, like, spicy, something yeah. spicy, but also salty. It's really good. It's really good. Oh. And the audience has weighed in with no spoon. No spoon. no spoon. No spoon. Ooh. Somebody said it doesn't matter if you made the pasta, just eat it any way you want. Really? It, so long as it ends up in your mouth. Okay. <laughs> what this, were you talking about? We don't so? discriminate yeah. how you eat your pasta. Uh, I didn't even understand the concept of using a spoon until I went to college and saw other people doing it. They're probably <laughs> Irish. <laughs> <laughs> they know that's <laughs> I got to tell you, this sauce has a ton of garlic in it, so... Back off. <laughs> Garlic is a secret. I feel, I, I will really? put like, well, when I first started cooking, I thought a clove of garlic, and when it was a recipe of a clove, I thought that was, you know, the whole clump. Oh my. <laughs> so I would end up doing like, yeah, a whole, well, I don't even know what the whole garlic head, I guess is what it's called. Oh, geez Louise. But it's good for you. Very so, healthy. Yeah, yeah, so even if well, I- Well, I will can... say, I eat less carbs with a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> so Can't go. get them off a spoon. So know. now, are there any well, more books? <laughs> Are, are you are we done with our delectable reads for today? Oh, uh, what time is it? I, I, one more. Are we think. off? Are we are we done? I is it eleven? Oh my goodness! It's quarter after. Minutes. Minutes. All right, oh, right. we have fifteen minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's all just do one more. Okay. <coughs> okay. Well, I have well, one really important one, one that I think we should <laughs> sing others' word. <laughs> <laughs> An important one to get in before we leave. Okay. Sorry. They're all important. So this one. Politically important. Now I feel bad because I feel like I'm kidding. Them. <laughs> okay, so this Afterlife by Alice Marie Johnson. So I'm sure everyone knows in the news, Alice Johnson is made famous by Kim Kardashian. She helped commute her sentence. She was serving um, a life sentence in, Mem in Memphis for a nonviolent drug trafficking charge. Um, and before she was arrested, she had had no criminal record. She was a manager of FedEx. She was a wife. She was a mother. She just dealt with a uh, loss of a child. She had all this stuff going on, but then she lost her job and her marriage, and of course, her son, and she kind of turned to some other ways to pay the bills. You have to make it make it happen. And so she, she had 
gotten in with this crowd and when she got arrested in the state at that time she there was no there were a lot of consequences so she was serving life in prison and Kim Kardashian really was on for her behalf went to the president and really um, advocated for her and she got her sentence commuted she is out and it is you have to go watch this video um, it's on Edelweiss of Kim and Alice talking and they're just like family she's it's like she's known her forever and she's like I just want this to be a, a thing going forward this is advocacy we're gonna stand up and it's not she's not the only one so it's really special we have her <laughs> memoir and Alice is gonna tell her story but in prison she had like this whole reformation of her life she became a a, pre a preacher she wrote a play she would like mentor these women she really just she took her life and she didn't sit around and feel sorry for herself. She really took her life back. Um, but now that she's out, she really gets to advocate for other people. She's actually going to be honored at the UN in March on the 8th for International Women's Day. And she's going to be honored for women's a women's right defender. So she, I think this is special. It's going to tell her story. And like like Kim said, it's, she's not the only one. You we And you don't have to feel a loss of hope if this is happening to you. Um, because there's a lot of people in prison that... Yeah. Nonviolent crimes, um, one time offenders. So, very special. This one comes out in uh, May, hmm. Afterlife. Hmm. Couple of thrillers. We're going to talk about a couple of thrillers. Okay. I have one, you have one. I got one, you got one. Go uh, okay. Uh, Okay, okay. Um, thank you. Um, I know what's happening. So I want to talk about Lady in the Lake by Laura Lippman. Here's the jacket. Uh, Laura Lippman, you'll know uh, from, she has her series, and then she also has her standalones, which include Wild Lake and most recently Sunburn, which is a great kind of noirish uh, standalone. Laura Lippman is a revered thriller author, rightfully so. I really, when I'm reading this book, what I felt page after page is, oh my God, she is a master. Like, that's how good she is. Um, She's just to give you some some. She's won the Anthony Award eight times, eight times. She's won the Edgar Award, the Sham, the Agatha. She's won everything. Um, and this new novel, I think, it's just special. It's it's incredible. So just to frame it, um, Laura lives in Baltimore, and she knows like I think Baltimore so well. I think, and this novel takes place in 1960s Baltimore, and follows this young like she's in her 30s she's she was a housewife who decided she needed a change so she split with her husband again this is 1960s that's like a big daring not entirely accepted by society <laughs> move but she does it and she departs and she wants to get involved with something special and what she finds is that she has this knack for like m missing person cases murder cases and she try she attempts to join the local newspaper um, and she becomes involved in, she becomes obsessed really with this disappearance of this young African American woman who was beautiful. She, she shined, but she disappeared and seemingly no one cares. Um, and what's fascinating about this novel, it's told from two viewpoints. One, you follow Maddie, this you know, kind of budding re reporter, as she's trying to get down to the bottom of what happened to this woman, Cleo. But you also get Cleo's viewpoint. Uh, you see her, she's basically speaking from beyond the grave and she's observing what Maddie is attempting to do. And Cleo is not really that eager to be found. She's not eager for her body to be found. It's not like overwhelmingly supernatural. It's just this really fascinating, you know, kind of literary device that Laura is using. Um, and again, I, she's, she's just a beautiful, fascinating writer, but this is also, again, a thriller and it is just it's punchy and fast paced and this is like a one sitting read um yeah i don't know i mean v, you're you're a big laura Lippman fan love her uh, yeah i just i can't say enough about her she's absolutely incredible so. and this um this is uh based on a true story did you say that no okay. i didn't actually, um no. yeah this is based on a true story so um uh it's um yeah I and mean, did you read sunburn oh my god I love that book so much. I love all of her books. She's brilliant. She's just a brilliant person. Um, and so, oh God, she's so good at writing um, compelling characters and yep. twisty stuff and just smart, smart, smart. So yes, um, based on a, based sadly on true story and um, big, big expectations for this book. So yeah, love her. Mm -hmm. 
Laura Littman. We love her. Okay. So good. May I go? Yes. Are you all done? Yes. Oh, the perfect fraud. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now we're we're um, winding down, but this is one that I need to get in. Like, we need to get hers in. Um, so, uh, this one is uh, coming out in June. So, you'll be, we'll be talking about this for quite some time. But um, this is... Um, this is a terrific uh, psychological, twisty bit of a thriller. Um, it's a debut novel, and it's about two very strong women. Um, they don't quite know each other in the beginning. They don't know each other at all, actually. So you first meet this woman, Claire, who is living in um, Arizona and kind of dodging calls from her mother. Why? Because her mother is a psychic, and um, Claire is uh, pretending sort of to be in the family business of psychics but she doesn't actually have the gift she feels she is a fraud and she is avoiding this um, she doesn't want to you know fess up um, that's part one then you meet um, miles and miles away you meet this other woman Raina she's a young divorced mother she has a four-year-old daughter who I think her name is Stephanie and this child is terribly ill and no matter how many doctors uh, her mother brings her to or she goes on all these mommy bloggers to you know it's like this is you know what's happening and she the kid just keeps getting sicker and so by chance meeting these two women um, meet uh, a, on a plane and they strike up this conversation and they try and help each other that's the basis of the story it's 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 also as I say a very twisty psychological thriller about lies and truth and how everybody has something to hide. What's cool about this is that it does involve uh, psychics and some witchcraft, which is very kind of interesting and intriguing, and and it makes it just a, an even more delicious read. Um, the author does this really great job of just, you know, peeling away the layers slowly, and you you know you see what's really going on with these. So they both have something to hide. Something's going on with both of them. Um, <clears throat> um, so. There's great quotes in already for this book. This is a debut. Uh, Amy Malloy, who wrote The Perfect Mother, which was a huge bestseller, she says, be sure to set aside a, few, a full few hours because once you begin, you won't be able to stop. The Perfect Fraud is exactly what a good book should be. A dazzling plot, unforgettable characters, emotional depth, all presented in a fresh new voice that is sure to make Ellen LaCourt a household name. Boom! More quotes, pages of quotes. The, the raves are phenomenal. Um, Laurie Frankel, uh, they, they, they just go on. They just say, you know, it's, it's, you can't put it down. It is compelling. It's page turning. You don't know what's going to happen next. Um, we're, we're, we're all jonesing on this book. So you're going to hear us talk a lot more about this book over and over again because it's just that good. So congratulations to Ellen McCourt and this debut thriller. The Perfect Fraud. Um, two things. Yes. One, I forgot Kim Kardashian is writing the foreword of Afterlife. I wanted to make sure to say that. Also, we have pieces of her if we want to talk for a second. Yeah, we should. It's under there, I think. It's under my, it's under my eggplant. <laughs> <laughs> so, you probably have heard, but Pieces of Her by Karen Slaughter is going to be picked up by, or going to be made into an eight-episode series for Netflix. So, we're really excited. This is, you can get it now. If you haven't read Karen Slaughter, this is the book you need to read. Um, it's it's really great. It has to do with the mother daughter. Mom has had a past. Daughter doesn't know. She goes on the run because something happens. Check it out. Uh, available now, and we're excited for it to be on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, that's man, that's cool. That's really cool. All right. So I think are we wrapping up? We could do a we could do a lightning round. Um, do we have any minutes left? Go for it. Yeah. What have we got, Lainey? Do you have any left? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Da, 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 da. All right. I just want to sit around and eat pasta and have somebody read to me. I've been so. eyeballing the pasta the entire time. It's like half to the I camera, know. half it's to the pasta. <laughs> just waiting, waiting. Our time will come, pasta. Just you and me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's really good. Sorry. Out? Oh, okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, the next one is The Huckle and Goose Cookbook by Anka Todrick and Christine Lakalshi. So this is from the website Huckle and Goose, and you can check it out. It's got all these great recipes, and they have an amazing Instagram at Huckle Goose. 
And so for this, the whole short, long story short, they were working and their moms and they're coming home, they don't have anything to cook and they picked up gooseberries and huckleberries and they, these berries only are done at a certain small point in time and so you have to be really thoughtful and careful when you cook them because they don't come around a lot and they wanted to experiment with them and they wanted to bring that back to life and into our kitchen. So these are really simple recipes, you don't have to think. They, it's like a week, they plan it in all the book week plans you just get it and cook it and you are just more sustainable and you're thoughtful and it's amazing and I'm, i could talk for a long time just go to their website and we'll put a link to all of their stuff Come can on. i see that front mm -hmm. yeah that's so i love that yeah huckle and goose is great yeah Chris. real easy for life on the go all right i'll squeeze in two very quickly one is um a book that we're all I mean, we're excited, but it's an emotional release. It's Remembering Anthony Bourdain, which is coming May 28th. Um, we don't have a jacket yet for this, um, but just to frame this, this is going to be a collection of images of Anthony, uh, you know, around food and his travels. And then it's also a collection of thoughts and memories and quotes of people who knew him and loved him. Um, you know, if you remember his passing uh, last year in June and just the, just the breadth and so many people were in, impacted by him positively and then of course by his his passing he was just such an influential warm um, trailblazing figure um, and so there's a lot of great quotes by people who knew him um, I love this photo of him with uh, Barack Obama his quote from uh, Barack is low plastic stool cheap but delicious noodles cold Hanoi beer this is how I'll remember Tony. He taught us about food, but more importantly, about its ability to bring us together, to make us a little less afraid of the unknown, we'll miss him. Um, so it's all quotes like this. I just, I don't think you can overstate mm -hmm. the impact that he had on so many people, um, especially with his, his traveling, I think, and, and how you engage other cultures appropriately and, and learn from them. Um, that's such an important thing, how to do that, begin with the right mindset and the right execution and he did um so again that's coming may 28th that's remembering anthony bourdain um and one book a cookbook that i had talked about briefly before but i just want to bring up again is artist and sourdough um this is a recipe book for sourdough bread um casper and martin the authors are from norway um and they've developed their kind of sourdough passion over the years. Sourdough is this very ancient tradition. It goes back, I think it was 5,000 years. Um, sourdough bread is made in an interesting way in that it's really technically, I think, better for you and your digestive system. It's just more tailored to how we digest food. Um, and so it's just a great, beautiful book. Our, I mean, our Harper Design team is just absolutely amazing. All their cookbooks are beautiful, but um, again, as a budding cook and baker, um, it's aspirational, but also very attainable, which is very important with these. Um, it's I'm getting more and more hungry. Gotta put that down because I want some sourdough. I know bread. sourdough bread is amazing. When are you gonna make us some? Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow, <laughs> Saturday. Oh, <laughs> Monday. We'll be over in our onesies. <laughs> <laughs> uh. yeah. All right, we got time for one last one. Okay. okay. Um, do you, well, Go for it. okay, I, you know what, I'm going to talk about this book um, in our subsequent Facebook Lives because there's a lot to talk about in this book, but I just want to get it on your radar right now. It's called The Book of Pride, LGBTQ Heroes Who Changed the World by Mason Funk. This is, um, this is interviews with um, LGBTQ heroes, so these are people who, um, who have uh, been in the, uh, during the life, uh, this author's, um, lifetime. Uh, these are his contemporaries or people who have um, stories to tell um, about um, coming out uh, and I'm not fighting the fight, um, uh, religious fights, political fights, fights to keep their jobs, uh, a coming teachers, a teacher in Maine who came out of the closet uh, after she had spoken to one of her students who um, had graduated and come back and said actually how awful her life had been in school. Um, because she was struggling with uh, staying in the closet. The teacher had no idea, and she said, what could I have done to help you? And she said, you could have come out. Oh, my God. There are so many powerful stories in this book 
um, that I swear to God my toes are curling right now talking about it because they are inspirational, they're heartwarming, they're some of them are sad, some of them are powerful. They're all, I feel like in the end, they're all very, they're, they are, they're all very uplifting and affirmative. Um, but I think this is a really important book. Uh, Gay Pride Month coming up, this will be on sale uh, in advance of that, it goes on sale in May. Um, um, but um, oh, in 2019 is the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. There's information here about this. Uh, I, I can't do this book justice in a couple of minutes time, so in the next Facebook Live we'll talk about it some more. But I urge you all to check this book out. Go to Ada Weiss um, and, uh, and look this book up. This is the Book of Pride, LGBTQ Heroes Who Changed the World. And indeed they did. I wish I could, the pictures are so amazing. Also, wait, let me just tell you one thing. I was flipping pages and like folding down pages like a maniac. Um, in this galley, but you can go to this website uh, because there are, you know, a lot of interviews and you couldn't get them all in. But if you go to Outwards, there's a digital digital uh, platform, and if you go to the outwardsarchive.org, outwords, O-U-T-W-O-R-D-S, archive.org, um, you can find every in interview that they've collected. They'll They'll blow you away. They're they're amazing, and uh, the people in there are just so brave and so cool, and I just loved it. So um, this author is the founder and executive director of Outwards. It's a non it's an award winning nonprofit that documents the history of LGBTQ people all over the United States. Go to that website. Go to the archives, and uh, be prepared to be transformed um, and transported um, to a, a time and into people's lives who were really. Uh, uh, very brave and uh, and inspirational. So that's the Book of Pride by Mason Funk. Uh, there. Right. Thank you. Share a, meal, share a meal with books you love, with people you love. Mm, nice. And thank you so much for cooking for us this Friday. Welcome. And we'll see you soon, I hope. Yes. Thank you all for tuning in. And here's to uh, a happy weekend and a happy uh, bowl of pasta for us <laughs> as, long as the cameras are off. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.